Namaste and welcome. My name is Sahana Singh. It is a pleasure to be back on the Sangam Talks platform, which is doing a phenomenal job of uh, increasing awareness about Indian history and civilization. So today we have with us uh, Sarvesh Tiwari ji. Um, so to give you uh, some context, a few weeks ago, um, Sangam Talks featured a talk by uh, Sarvesh Tiwari ji on the jihadis of INA, the Indian National Army. I was one of those who watched uh, Sarvesh Ji's talk very with a lot of interest. Um, it was, of course, very controversial, and the title itself, uh, "The Jihadis of INA," was very shocking. So, um, and the talk led to very many strong reactions, and uh, I believe a number of videos were created to rebut what uh, Sarvesh Ji said in his talk. So today, I want to ask uh, Sarvesh Ji some uh, questions. Uh, related to his talk to go deeper into what he said and also into what he did not say so uh, uh, to tell you a little bit about sarvesh ji he is a researcher blogger and a speaker on subjects related to indian history and civilization languages culture and so on he is the founder of uh, samskara foundation which is promoting traditional indian knowledge and way of life amongst children so namaste sarvesh ji welcome Namaste, Sahana Ji. Um, I would like to uh, start our conversation with a prayer to the historians who have done so much of hard work and effort to uncover Indian past. Vina yakam namaskritya vande devim saraswati namami vyasa valmiki cheti hasa diva karo. Kalhanam bilhanam banam, Ema chandram namam yaham, Varam maju madarancha, Jadunatham bhaje puna, Nilakantham surendramcha, Kane varyam visheshata, Urandare varam vande, Jam bhandara karadvayam, Munim ramasvaru pancha, Sita Ramam Tapasvinam, Bhutartha Bodhane Sarvan, Siddhan Pranav Mishraddhaya. Once again, Namaste Sanaji. Uh, namaste, and, uh, Sarveshi. Thank so, you very much. Uh, first of all, um, it was actually your inspiration uh, and your introduction uh, to the Sangam Talks platform uh, that I had delivered a couple of talks last month. Uh, one was on the journey of the shloka of Vasudeva Kutumbukam, and uh, another was about the Khilafat movement, some less known facts and a bigger picture, especially because it is a hundred years completion of the end of the um, or peak of the Khilafat movement in India. So, as an outcome of that Khilafat talk, uh, there was uh, some interest in talking about some other uh, related uh, topics. And uh, the talk on the so-called jihadis of INA, as it was titled, or jihadis within INA, uh, that was uh, how it was spawned off. And as you said, uh, for some reason, it evoked a lot of reaction of various kind. And uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, there was a lot of interest. Uh, uh, oh, understandably, people. it was quite uh, shocking. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was very different from what we know about our history. True. So, True. Yeah. so did you True. get lots of reactions to, to what you spoke? I, I did. So many people expressed a lot of surprise, uh, especially about some of the facts they said they had not even known about. A uh, lot of people uh, expressed encouragement, especially some of the um, academic historians who reached out and uh, said that they were aware of the facts, but uh, it requires, <laughs> it's politically incorrect to say some of these things and uh, requires uh, more treatment. And then there were also a uh, couple of uh, people on uh, social media who reached out that I came to know through uh, Sangam Talks team who wanted to uh, also debate the points raised by me in the talk. And uh, so um, especially uh, Sri Chandrachud Ghosh ji and Sri Anujdhar ji, both of them scholars and authors of multiple books. Uh, they wanted to also have a debate or discussion with me based on what I said in the talk. 
so although i was little bit surprised because um, i uh, was not sure which part of the talk what exactly is it that was objectionable so um, i however readily and happily accepted to engage uh, because after all as the famous uh, nyaya goes vade vade jayate tatva bodha bodhe bodhe bhasate chandra chudaha that's a famous saying it says that by debating and debating discussing and discussing tatva bodh occurs the true realization of reality occurs and it is by uh, realizing the reality that you achieve chandra chud so that's just a uh, no pun intended that's just a, a coincidence that this famous shloka has the name of shri chandra chud ji also <laughs> so i accepted but uh, since i was not sure what exactly is it that they wanted to discuss i requested sangam talks to check with them uh, w- what is the framework what is exactly is uh, that they want to discuss about so as um, our nyaya tradition is uh, when you have a vada uh, you need to establish what is prameya what is the exact uh, topic that you are discussing what is the statement that a vadi has made for which prativadi uh, is uh, refuting so i wanted them to establish that i uh, so they wrote back i think uh, they said three things that uh i said that netaji was an islamic appeaser that he had no understanding of islam that he had been taking measures that would have made india even more islamic so now my talk was actually not about netaji my talk if anybody listens it was about the islamic elements jihadi elements uh, who are related sometimes directly sometimes indirectly in that phase of indian history which is dominated by ina i clearly mentioned in my talk that uh, we are trying to raise some questions and explore some less known aspects of how islamic elements bordered ina were part of ina my story started actually before even bose uh, was heading ina it continued into exploring the motivations of many muslims uh, to join ina it explored the behavior patterns of many muslims uh, as part of ina and even after uh, netaji bose disappeared what were these elements of ina or ex ina now doing so my whole talk uh, if somebody listens is about jihadis of ina it is not about netaji now netaji being closely related with ina of course will find place in that conversation an extent of um, the scope for me about netaji in this talk was uh, how he dealt how he responded what was way of um, encouraging motivating or even enticing some of these elements to join etc so that was the limit for me and um, even i had i think i have um, if somebody Uh, without uh, bias listens to the talk uh, been pretty sympathetic to him i even said uh, that uh, explicitly said that there are a lot of compulsions uh, under which netaji had to take some of those decisions that he did and i even ex- explained those compulsions with some facts i explained why he was forced to do some of those things so anyways uh, i uh, requested um, that uh, if chand chud ji wants to have a conversation on that topic i am open i'm also open to talk about netaji bose but that's a different topic if if uh, in individually on its own if they want to talk about it i'm open to that but that's not a reaction to my video and uh, so i i gave them uh, my own um, proposal that if you want to talk about ina and jihadis uh, i am open to engage but in the meanwhile uh, sahna ji uh, there were a couple of uh, reaction videos if we can call it uh, that uh, appeared uh, criticizing my talk uh, one was by shri anuj dhar ji uh, on his own youtube channel a few days after my talk i'm not sure whether he even heard what i was saying because the about 20 minutes that he spent there he um, he didn't address any points i have raised he um, he was getting just personal he has in his uh, reaction video said uh, some pretty uncharitable things uh, i will not go into uh, those but i just want to say that uh, just want to say that uh, there, there is a shloka in rajatrangini uh, by kalhana that says 
ಶ್ಲಾಘ್ಯ ಸ ಏವ ಗುಣವಾನ್ ರಾಗ ದ್ವೇಷ ಬಹಿಷ್ಕೃತ ಭೂತಾರ್ಥ ಕಥನೆ ಯಸ್ಯ ಸ್ಥೇಯಸ್ಯೇವ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವೆರಿ ಪ್ರಿಫೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಜತರಂಗಿಣಿ ದಟ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ಎಂಡೆವರ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೋರ್ ದಿ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟೆಲ್ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ದೇ ಶುಡ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ರಾಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ್ವೇಷ್ ಅವೇ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಇಫ್ ದೇರ್ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಔರ್ ದೇರ್ ಭಾಷಾ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ರಾಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ್ವೇಷ ವಿಲ್ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪ್ರೇಸ್ ವರ್ ದಿ ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ಸ್ so of course i'm as uh, shri surjit das gupta ji said nobody i'm nobody to also preach or uh, suggest anything to these established uh, authors it's still just a reminder that history should be analyzed discussed passionlessly without rag for an individual or uh, fact attachment emotionally and also dvesha without having any enmity or hatred towards anybody because Absolutely. when you, you your mind is clouded with raga and dvesha uh, you fail to see so many other aspects of the reality munde munde matir bhinna every head has a different mind so only if you uh, are open minded uh, you will realize those things sana ji and then the second video came out uh, was by shri uh, surjit das gupta ji on surf news channel where uh, he uh, i think uh, his premise i mean when he uh, kind of gave an overview of my talk it is not even a caricature of what he was saying <laughs> i did not talk about bos um, but he made it as if it, uh, i called him islamist in the twitter that he used with the tweet that he used to promote that video he said i either called him an islamist or uh, i think he said that uh, bos walked into the trap laid by islamists i have not said either of the two things uh, also overall i think sana ji the caricature uh, uh, of um, my premise uh, was not uh, characteristic of what i was saying so i do hope that at some point uh, you know there will be a dispassionate discussion between uh, all of you where you can all exchange uh, your ideas and thoughts directly uh but in uh, so i just uh, can i start uh, asking my questions i have prepared a list of questions for you um related to your talk so i what i felt was that in your talk you're not uh, clear about many things uh you know you uh, started talking about ina and how it it already existed when uh, bose uh, subhash uh, chandra bose you went to uh, germany but you were not clear about who founded the ina uh, so you didn't say who is the founder and also you did not dwell on what was the role of ina in uh, securing india's freedom from the british rule you mentioned that it played a role but you didn't really uh, expand on it i think it'll be good if you can start with that tell us what uh, what was the uh, contribution of ina to getting our freedom from uh, the british rule uh, let me take a few minutes and uh, share my perspective on that so just like uh, so many other movements of um, the larger indian freedom fight for independence um ina movement also had uh, somewhat various elements that were happening in parallel short answer to who founded ina is of course uh, shri rash bihari bose the great revolutionary but that's a short answer and two There more are... people right there were two more people i think along with him again ultimately there were many people with him to do that but ultimately um, it was shri rash bihari bose who founded the organization we called indian national army and there was a larger organization behind it the political wing uh, indian independence league uh, but as i was saying uh, there are many things happening in parallel so let's stick with the uh, rash bihari bose ji himself rash bihari bose was a very great um, uh, revolutionary i mentioned it as part of uh, answer to a question that was raised in the talk after the talk so in 1912 uh, he became so famous he became um, uh, very prominent with his alleged uh, role of uh, throwing a bomb on viceroy hardings in delhi so 
um, we can understand that this whole decade of 1910 and the decade prior, uh, it was the revolutionary uh, decades, revolutionary phase of uh, uh, Indian independence movement. So Rash Bihari Bose ji uh, came to prominence with that. Uh, he then founded, um, he went to Kashi and he taught many other revolutionaries in these activities not only in the ideology, but also tactics of revolutionary activities. He trained many revolutionaries in, uh, in Banaras. He is one revolutionary who British could never catch. Only one of few who uh, British police was never able to find. So he left uh, India, he went to Japan and uh, settled down there. He married, um, he married a Japanese uh, woman. Um, into the family of Japanese um, uh, black dragon, etc., cetera, uh, connections. So there, um, then he spent uh, next few decades. And INA's uh, journey um, in seeds is actually throughout his activities in Japan. He was in touch with uh, Indian leaders. Particularly, it is interesting to know that uh, with uh, Swatantri Veer Savarkar ji, he was in constant touch with. There is a letter um, exchanged um, between them. It says that uh, he wanted to start Hindu Mahasabha International Chapter in all of uh, East Asia. And Savarkar wrote back congratulating him, encouraging him to do that, saying that uh, it should, however, not be a splinter organization. Let it be as part of the global, larger India-based Hindu Mahasabha. And uh, this is in 1930s. He was also doing a lot of uh, what we can call, or British press called propaganda uh, in creating solidarity within Japan, within East Asia, uh, towards the Indian freedom movement. He was very active uh, in the Japanese press. He knew Japanese language. He was one of the few Indians who um, had command over Japanese language. So in the Japanese media, much before the World War II started, he was already creating an atmosphere of sympathy towards Indian cause. And just like he was training revolutionaries in India before he left in uh, India, there also he trained many people across Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, uh, uh, in uh, 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 Thailand. He created more than 25 chapters of what was later known as Indian Independence League. Even before Indian Independence League came into picture, he also started um, what came to be known as uh, in Hindu-German conspiracy. So Hindu-German conspiracy, uh, again, it's a British term, conspiracy. But really, the initiative was that revolutionaries in the expatriate community, particularly in the USA and in the East Asia and in Europe, they acquire arms from the anti-British forces, particularly Germany. So they, they, their uh, whole idea was to supply Indian revolutionaries in India with high quality arms, ammunition. Um, and there were so many events uh, behind which the fingerprints of uh, Sri Raj Bihari Bose can be seen. A lot of these international revolutionary activities were happening and Raj Bihari Bose loomed very large. He, he was the uh, very well-known, respected figure. Now, Subhash Chandra Bose, parallelly, Subhash Chandra Bose, again, Subhash Chandra Bose also was in touch with Rajpi Hari Bose. So they were not strangers. There are communications between them. Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, after he quit Congress or was forced to quit Congress in a way in 1938-39 time frame, he uh, again had these ideas of going abroad and uh, doing something which applies pressure on British. And Subhas Bose, uh, if we read his speeches back in uh, 30s, mid 30s, even little early 30s, he had been able to predict that there is going to be a global world war kind of an event. War will break out. He was able to foresee. And as a matter of fact, after having quit Congress, when he met uh, Savarkar, the meeting of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and Savarkar uh, in 1940 is recorded. Um, 
again same day when he went to bombay and met uh, savarkar he had met chinna already chinna and ambedkar as well so with these leaders outside congress they were all uh, on the periphery or outside congress uh, it is savarkar uh, who suggested uh, to bose that uh, instead of wasting time in the indian politics uh, your time is uh, better spent if you provided the young militantic leadership to a vast resources that are available outside india for indians again i don't want to say that it was savarkar who gave the idea uh, to bose to start the azad hind fauj etc it will perhaps again uh, be simplistic reduction of it what i'm saying is that this idea of going outside india and starting existed in the atmosphere so bose might already have independently on his own as well be thinking about it but the matter of fact is that this topic came up in their conversation with savarkar and although not immediately uh, after a few months after almost a year uh, that is the action that bose eventually ended so up I was, taking i was also actually reading uh, vikram sampath's uh, biography of savarkar and in that he mentions that there is just one source that is the secretary of savarkar who said that uh, in this private meeting uh, this is what savarkar suggested to netaji to go outside india and uh, uh, take prisoners of war and uh, make, gear them up to attack uh, the british army so there is just yeah. one source that's what i have i read over there right right we may not know it was um, i think a short meeting couple of hours meeting perhaps Hmm. Uh, it was one on one meeting we don't know what transpired right. and uh, perhaps uh, we may never know what uh, the true conversation was um but on the other hand there are some police reports some cid reports uh, which are actually available where british police uh, interrogated uh, an associate of subhas bose uh, and in that interrogation that associate did say uh, that he went to japan and he was uh, already preparing the ground for subhas bose to leave india so yes uh, there are, there were many things happening as i was saying uh, india was well connected by then we had enough newspapers and uh, information coming from uh, different parts of the world so uh, many initiatives of similar nature m- might be happening and bose um, again once he reached germany he started of course working with uh, uh, the idea of creating that army and um, the free india centers and lot of other things what different names can be given but foundation being that recruit the prisoners of war turn them into an army and fight against the british this idea parallelly Uh, happened uh, in germany by subhas chandra bose and it was already happening in some shape um, it took a definite shape once japan entered the war but it already existed in the atmosphere also in japan under the leadership of rash bihari bose but i also want to add that outside of this also there uh, for example if you study the japanese war papers around world war 2 they were trying independent of all these they were also trying to create these armies in every asian country that was colonial uh, controlled by european powers mm-hmm. it was it was japanese uh, war strategy to create these armies sometimes these will be revolutionaries armies of civilians sometimes where the um, colonial armies existed it would also recruit from them which of course biggest was british indian army others did not have like that but this plan uh, japanese already had there is one interesting um, episode that japanese war papers reveal that they had recruited some nepalis so they had uh, because nepal had a lot of buddhist shrines and japanese had a lot of buddhist uh, travelers who would go to nepal uh, with help of um, a prominent uh, leader satyanand ji in, in bangkok uh they established a route of having about um, few uh, perhaps less than 100 nepali uh, folks who can become a conduit and from nepal they can then uh, do something to enter india so th- there were a lot of uh, the point was that japanese independently also were trying to do something even if 
um, even if um, everything else set aside, there was some independent initiative by Japanese too. And ultimately, however, coming back, there was a convergence. So Mohan, uh, General Mohan Singh, uh, who was uh, captured by Japanese, he became the first general. They promoted him, uh, announced him to be a general. And he eventually agreed to lead the Indian National Army. Um, now, Mohan Singh would not yet be in contact with Raj Bihari Bose. It is, it is after um, a few weeks, few months, that uh, a conference was organized where Raj Bihari Bose was officially selected, elected as the president of um, that whole organization. One part of that organization was Indian, uh, uh, this INA. So uh, bottom line is there were a lot of different threads, but finally it converged into a formal organization called INA, founded officially by Rashbi Haribos, and then um, taken over as the leader. He passed on the mantle of leadership to Subhash Chandra Bose once he reached uh, uh, East Asia. So Subhash Chandra Bose actually galvanized INA when he went to uh, when he joined forces with Ra Rashbi Haribos, right? So when until Sub Subhash Chandra Bose went to Japan, INA, INA had not become the big entity that it became later, right? With those huge number of soldiers. Uh, once the INA was founded, the initial part of INA was founded, it still required charismatic leadership. Now, Rush Bihari Bose was an aged person by this time. He, in fact, passed away. Next year, he passed away also after giving leadership to Subhas uh, Bose. And the rest of the um, uh, leadership such as um, Mohan Singh, for example. General Mohan Singh was a very young person. And uh, although he was an officer, the Indian officers of the British Indian Army were not trained in leadership that much. So if we read the memoirs written by many uh, people who have seen uh, firsthand how the British Indian Army was conducted, there was a, a huge amount of racism and one part of that was that at the same rank, a white officer and an Indian officer, disparity not only in salaries, but also training given. So the Indian soldier leadership, uh, military generals, captains, uh, majors, etc., would not have the leadership uh, training given to them. So INA required somebody charismatic, somebody magnetic, somebody who can motivate, somebody who can really um, stand up um, and behind whom everybody can march. That personality was Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. And Mohan Singh, in fact, uh, if we read Mohan Singh in his own letters to Japanese uh, in uh, minutes of meetings, etc., that um, are available in the phase one of INA, he would often say, please bring Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose to East Asia. Why are you not bringing him? Bring him because I'm not uh, able to do without him, things like those. So absolutely, it is after Netaji who uh, then reorganized, gave the leadership it, it required, who motivated the civilian population so much. But again, uh, uh, Sanaji, I think uh, we should carefully also see that the size of INA before Netaji joined um, was about 20,000 soldiers who had accepted to join um, INA. After Netaji came, uh, it of course took a uh, far bigger shape um, and also it took um, a very structured approach. Uh, we can see the motivation level of uh, soldiers and civilians alike go tremendously up. Um, it uh, gave um, a very, um, I would say, Bigger than what it really was, projection within India. So there used to be so much of uh, um, uh, motivation, not just in the civilians of East Asia, but Indians in India. So INA, uh, once it was um, started to be led by Netaji, uh, used to become talk of um, every day. Because after 1942, as again I said in my uh, conversation on Sangam Talks, independence movement meant INA. After 1942-43, particularly 43, independence movement in public memory, in public psyche, is INA. And therefore, um, 
of course uh, you cannot uh, undermine or overstate the role played by netaji subhash chandra bose in recreating remotivating reorganizing ina once he took over i mean we literally owe our independence to them i mean without the ina doing what it did attacking from the eastern front the jolt that it sent to the british officers to make them realize that they that they cannot govern india anymore so uh, we owe so much to ina so i think you would accept that isn't it that uh, we owe absolutely to ina to a, to a very large extent a- absolutely uh, so uh, again there are uh, two or three uh, different uh, opinions uh, about uh, about that one is that british had already kind of made up their mind to quit india uh, but they needed a last push to finally just leave and um even though ina uh, did not succeed militarily uh, after the initial successes on the north uh, eastern front uh, of course british um, captured the burma again they uh, once again captured singapore and so on um, japan was defeated ina uh, soldiers were taken back by the british army as again um, prisoners of war or interned brought back to india so militarily ina might not have achieved that delhi chalo objective directly but as you said ina did two or three things first of all it proved beyond any shadow of doubt that indian soldiers of indian army are not loyal to crown anymore british uh, army officers or politicians might have even after this uh, made public uh, speeches and statements uh, to the contrary but it is very obvious and clear um, in their personal correspondences which have later become available that they could not trust indian army um, indians in the indian army anymore and uh, the whole british uh, colonial administration on um, in, in india depended on the indian soldiers of british army there were very small population of britishers themselves it was because of the loyalty of the uh, soldiers that uh, they were ruling india once that loyalty is gone then they would have to either bring a huge number of um, british soldiers if they wanted to continue which their economics did not permit anymore the british economy had been wrecked by the second world war and um, um, as uh, rc majumdar says that it was a pyrrhic victory while the anglo americans won while the england was uh, on the winning side it was really not a victory they first of all lost their place as the top rate most powerful nation in the world usa replaced them they became uh, simply uh, sidekicks of uh, america after that secondly they lost their uh, economic uh, prowess as well so they could not have afforded to recruit more Uh, raise more british soldiers for the british army and ina took away the loyalty also therefore even if not militarily that ina contributed non militarily through this um, uh, weakening of the um, trust of british in the their own army uh, ina contributed that is number 1 right. number 2 ina also contributed perhaps in another way timing so british of course um, uh, it is clear that british had made up their mind to quit india they knew that they could not afford to rule india anymore but the sense of urgency to quit now that urgency also possibly was because of the ina and then um, ina openly uh, uh, inspired the indian navy mutiny and other mutinies that happened uh, after 1946 Uh, so all of that created that urgency for british to leave so those ways uh, you definitely i agree with you cannot undermine the role played by ina in the indian independence movement in fact uh, savarkar uh, after independence gave a very famous speech uh, describing the reasons how india at that time got independence he gave four reasons i will not go into the other three but fourth reason he said is 
the work of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and INA. So four reasons he gives. One of those is INA. So um, I'm not uh, very sure whether the British were really planning to leave because there was some co correspondence that indicated that uh, they wanted to hold on to India. So that is an argument put forward by many people that maybe they won't have left for quite some time. Uh, so so INA gave that push and all those mutinies gave that push. Absolutely, absolutely. So that urgency came because of the final nail in the colonial coffin came from INA, no doubt about that. Right. Um, so I, is this a good time to ask you about partition? Because I wanted to know also about the role of INA. So the INA helped us to get freedom. What was Netaji's view about partition of India into a Muslim Pakistan and a, and a secular India and all those things? Do you, do you, would you like to discuss that? Sure. Yes. So... Netaji's speeches are recorded. Uh, in all his speeches from Singapore um, and East Asia, he would vehemently criticize the plan called pa pa Pakistan or partition of India. Okay. He absolutely clear terms, he was vehemently opposed to partition. There is no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. In my talk, I did mention that in one talk, only one talk that he gave, much earlier in Berlin, on Radio Berlin, in an interview, he mentioned something which was not as unequivocal. Mm -hmm. Facts are facts. It is recorded again, that talk uh, that he gave on Berlin Radio. There, he said, Pakistan will not be created as long as British are there. I assure Mr. Jinnah that Pakistan will not be created until British are there. It can only be created under a national government. Now, so that, that means only if they decide if, uh, if the government after the British leave, if they decide, then it right. Can... So right. So so he he basically he was saying that put independence before Pakistan um, from chronology standpoint. Okay. Let us push the British out, then we can talk about Pakistan. Or again, I I shouldn't read it like that. But basically, it is not unequivocal opposition to Pakistan. It's simply saying, perhaps, that um, British will not give you Pakistan. Indian government only or national government only can uh, explore the question of Pakistan. So that is the limit to which uh, Netaji perhaps uh, went on, on that question. But far more explicitly, you have the speeches and not one, but multiple speeches of uh, Netaji from East Asia, where he totally opposed the partition. Now, um, while on this topic, uh, I think uh, in the talk uh, that uh, Sri Surjit Das Gupta ji had coordinated, I think uh, the question that was asked by some panelists there was that, um, but I, again, I'm paraphrasing, um, that if Netaji was present uh, uh, at the time of uh, partition, would partition have happened or something like that? To which Sri Chandra Chudji had quoted uh, or paraphrased uh, Mujibur Rahman's uh, statement, Mujibur Rahman, the first uh, uh, leader of the independence uh, Bangladesh, independent Bangladesh, that uh, he remembered uh, in 1940s, middle of 1940s, he's talking about Mujibur Rahman that we used to listen to the broadcasts of Netaji's speeches and we used to be excited. And we used to feel that, okay, British will not be able to hold on to India any longer. However, what will happen to Pakistan if Netaji uh, and his INA came to India? Now, uh, I think uh, when uh, Shri Chandra Chudji mentioned it, he, um, he did not mention the part where Mujibur Rahman is more specifically asking about INA, not so much Netaji. Mm. The thought process, if you explore, thought process not only of Mujibur Rahman, but most of the Muslim League leaders in India, their assessment was that this creation of Pakistan is actually a bargaining um, process with British government. Indeed, Jinnah won Pakistan mostly uh, on the bargaining table. And of course, the, again, the urgency was created by the riots. 
but uh, the true pakistan movement was uh, a political movement and achieved by the bargaining with the british if ina would have successfully militarily conquered if not whole india at least bengal of course british uh, would be powerless to give them pakistan so mujibur rahman's uh, sense is not the charismatic leadership of netaji which again he has charism i'm saying what mujibur rahman is saying mujibur rahman is fearing ina's victory if ina won under netaji or under anybody else if ina would have won british would be powerless to give pakistan that's my sense of reading now much later much later uh, when bangladesh became independent uh, mujibur rahman gave another uh, of course the uh, the presidential speech so to say where he still remembered netaji he said if netaji uh, his thought process uh, would have succeeded uh, bangladesh would look very different or something like that he said again i am paraphrasing from memory he said uh, bengal would look very different let us understand that again uh, there is a difficulty in articulating uh, some of these things because they uh, become uh, misunderstood very easily so therefore i will slowly and carefully try to say this just before partition happened what could have been the role that bose must have played what could have been his thought process we do not know these are all hypotheses these are all speculations we do not know we do however know the facts about what many of the ina elements did around the time of partition what was the role played by them that we know we also know the role played by the leaders of forward block most particularly the older brother of subhash chandra bose we know the thought process of sarath bose so sarath bose after having seen that partition of india is inevitable and let me repeat after it became clear that partition of india cannot be avoided india will be partitioned once it became clear after that sarath bose was working with muslim league leaders and other muslim leaders whom he called nationalist muslims to create so called united bengal outside of india let me say this in different words earlier before that became clear that partition will happen uh, say 1945 middle of course like any other nationalist leader sarat bose also was against partition but once it became clear once the congress muslim league everybody decided in the principle that yes india will be partitioned despite having all the rhetoric like pakistan will be created over my dead body by gandhi gandhi accepted pakistan without doing any hunger strike etc once it became clear that india will be partitioned sarat bose worked with multiple muslim league leaders particularly suhravardi suhravardi is the guru political guru of mujibur rahman suhravardi was the prime minister of bengal at that time and sarath bose was the leader of congress in bengal and uh, forward bloc he actively worked with suhravardi and other muslim leaders to create the idea that okay all right let's keep bengal united they called it bengal united what it meant was today's bangladesh with a bigger map your east Uh, your west bengal and bangladesh being one country called bengal that's very interesting hmm. sarat bose lobbied very hard uh, i shouldn't say very hard but he lobbied uh, he went to delhi he corresponded with congress leadership in center and he opened dialogues with the local uh, hindu leaders in bengal that if dividing india is a sin so it's a statement made by him recorded by other books if dividing india is a sin then dividing bengal is a bigger sin 
So it's interesting. It's, it's like he wasn't cognizant of what would happen to the Hindus in, in, he, in he, the Muslim majority uh, Bangladesh. He yes, he was saying again. So Sohravardhi etc. made statements, lot of statements. There is a there is um, um, the press conference which is uh, reported in Calcutta newspapers of that time. Sohravardhi addressed uh, exact same topic. He said that the I have talked to Jinnah. Jinnah has agreed that okay, you don't become Pakistan, you become separate country. I'm fine. Jinnah has given his blessings to the plan of United Bengal. uh it will be a secular country even bangladesh is a secular country today bangladesh is a secular country it's not a theocratic islamic country sohravardhi in 1946 is saying that uh, bangladesh would be uh, bengal would be uh, an independent sovereign secular country he said i am going to give a lot of lot of opportunities to hindus so sarth bos and muslim league actually uh, leaders they came up with a framework of how that independent bengal would be ruled um, there will be a uh, lot of religious tolerance independence given to hindus etc and shyam prasad mukherjee in his diary writes um, and in fact in speeches of shyam prasad mukherjee also it is very clear that giving a dream to bengali hindus of a paradise wanting us to forget the hell we are living in today bengal was continuously marred by so many riots very frequent riots not only the great calcutta killing of uh, 1946 august continuous riots it will require an absolutely absolutely let me say crazy wishful thinker to say that okay we will now out of this create a secular um, muslim majority country which will take care of its hindu population also did bangladesh take care of hindu population of course um, you can now see that bangladesh got created you have a secular bangladesh under the same leadership mujibur rahman mujibur rahman you can say was what um, sohravardhi would have been in 40s he was direct disciple of suravardhi and what is the situation of hindus in bangladesh so that was uh, the vision of uh, sarath bose older brother of subhas bose that is a fact not to limit here not to stop there in punjab also another associate of uh, netaji subhas chandra bose sardul singh kabiswar he was a sikh uh, forward block leader and long time associate of netaji he floated exact same idea in punjab also united punjab. punjab united punjab that we will take the not uh, not just one part of punjab but entire punjab should be an independent secular country jinnah was okay <laughs> quite honestly jinnah gave his blessings immediately to sohravardhi for united bengal remember that hmm. why because we misunderstand we absolutely misassess the thought process of muslims jinnah won't mind to separate bangladesh even pakistan now i mean sure there, there are nationalistic uh, thoughts which uh, and humiliation which they underwent pakistanis underwent in creation of bangladesh which makes them uh, makes it difficult for them to accept uh, bangladesh as a concept but in the previous times muslim leaders would have no problem if there are four pakistans created for them it's a different framework they don't care about uh, uh, so much about uh, nation state even if they can't articulate it that well their inner thought is absolutely clear always it is the civilization even if it is a separate uh, country called bangladesh away from pakistan that's okay so jinnah gave his blessings it took shama prasad mukherjee and hindu mahasabha uh, and savarkar so much of um, rising against this whole uh, whole crazy idea they especially mukherjee collaborated with uh, uh, sardar patel sardar patel was um, this the muscle man as uh, you know comes across iron man truly 
he did um, his politics which totally curtailed this idea this idea could have happened by the way this idea could have been a possibility if uh, enough wind was blowing in that direction such was the wishful thinking about secularism the priority that every sensible hindu leader in bengal and in india should have had in 1945 46 47 was to protect hindus the fanaticism the fundamentalism and truly the natural call of uh, majority muslims of india was uh, blowing in the direction of muslim league and pakistan the elections of uh, that year uh, clearly prove that muslims wholeheartedly supported jinnah and pakistan not just in bengal sindh punjab but uh, all over india so the role of any hindu leader from any political party from congress to mahasabha to forward block should have been to rise above all the ideological um, quips and really uh, protect hindus interests which is what dr shama prasad mukherjee sardar patel savarkar all other many other hindu leaders they actually understood that but not sarat bose hmm. ina muslims again in direct since we talking about great calcutta killing there are enough reports that lot of these ina returnees muslim ina returnees who had come back to india many of them had joined jinnah's muslim league guards there was an organization within muslim league called guards these organizations were basically um, the strong arms of muslim league to do all the violence really they would be marching kind of uh, show their strength things like those many of the ina people joined muslim league um, that uh, guard organization they conducted trainings there is a book by aisha jalal uh, that came out some time back it is on a different topic but she provides lot of um, less known facts how ina muslims in punjab they created uh, this uh, kind of um, uh, training for the youth muslim youth what will the muslim youth trained in the arms do they are not part of the army they are part of the muslim league's guard organization and same thing here in bengal also so in the riots there are mentions so the, during the four or five days of uh, extreme rioting lot of police reports cid reports are there some of them explicitly mention uh, the role of uh, the ina ex ina soldiers who were part of muslim league by then what else so i how do i conclude so uh, mujibur rahman for example um, he himself was a writer he ad- admits it in his autobiography mujibur rahman uh, says three times on three occasions he participated in riots his okay. first time, again um, Uh, hindu muslim riots uh, on side of muslims killing is a word i will not use i mean i don't know whether he physically killed somebody uh, but uh, yes he, he actively with with uh, with the um, lathi and whatever arms he had he participated in riots on on side of muslim league in fact first time he was arrested mujibur rahman the first time he was arrested was not for any independence related activity he did not do any independence activity only activity of his political career was muslim league and uh, pakistan so he was arrested for the first time uh, by the police for hitting and breaking open the head of a uh, hindu leader uh, hindu mahasabha leader he says that in his autobiography and the police report however says that he the, he, the hindu leader was stabbed fir says that uh, the leader was stabbed but he says that okay i gathered uh, some uh, muslim students muslim boys and uh, he says there was some reason that this hindu masaba leader uh, had kidnapped a muslim friend or something like that we don't know the other side of the story but fact remains 
he did uh, his first political act was breaking open the head of a hindu mahasabha leader <laughs> and in the great calcutta killing mujibur rahman was in calcutta he was still a uh, muslim league student wing leader and he says that uh, i um, to protect muslims i went out with uh, uh, the college students uh, to face the hindu crowds and uh, we picked up swords with anything else we could find and we went and uh, uh, responded to the rioting hindus again victim mentality i mean he's uh, he's saying that they were attacked so they responded back but he actually physically uh, participated in riots and then in between one more time he says he participated in these riots this is your uh, founder of bangladesh and if if you think uh, uh, that united bengal the dream of uh, sarat bos could have been something something great i leave it to the decision of my uh, hindu bengali brothers and sisters so sarvesh ji you mentioned uh, in your talk a number of names like uh, rashid ali al gilani and al husaini so you call them uh, islamists but mm-hmm. uh, uh, is it possible that they were they were more anti british and anti zionist than islamist because that's what they were opposing the british and the jew yeah. and the, right i mean was it really islamist would you like to would you call them islamist they were islamists uh, so uh the mufti of hitler husaini is very clearly an islamist there is no doubt about that uh see an individual will have multiple layers of uh, ideology there of course was um, in, uh, arab nationalism as well so there were a lot of leaders who uh, you can call uh, arab nationalists there were many of them but he is actual mufti of jerusalem he uh, definitely if you go through uh, the things that he was doing he at least is a very clearly pan islamist and the literature i'm not uh, going by the israeli literature if you go by the israeli uh, history uh, there are a lot of israeli historians who have written about those events uh, done a lot of work for a minute if you leave them out and if you look at the histories written in germany itself and uh, later the american historians um, after accessing the world war papers th- there should not be any doubt that uh, he for sure was an islamist no doubt in my mind uh or and in your talk of course you mentioned that netaji was a practicing hindu right uh, he, he yes again so <laughs> they, they, again there should not be um any iota of doubt that netaji was a very deep religious thorough solid grounded rooted hindu in his personal life he stands um, head and shoulder above uh, many other uh, in the secular uh, politics on the topic of being a hindu yourself a religious um, spiritual hindu i don't don't want to repeat things which i said i already said that and although shri uh, chandra chud ji said grudgingly that i have said it i have not said it grudgingly i uh, mukta kantha i am saying he was a uh, patriotic indian he was a um, solid well articulate hindu uh, of uh, spiritual convictions spiritual sadhana there is no doubt about that okay no uh, so from what i know of netaji i would think that he wanted the hindus and muslims to unite together and target their common enemy so that which is which is the british and he was able to make he was able to make them forget their differences and focus on the goal of uh, removing the british so he he was such a charismatic leader that he was able, able to even fire up the people who were not living in india to go and fight for uh, liberating india so um, what i was thinking is that uh, did netaji think that you know maybe i can use the religious zeal of the muslims and can harness it for uh, uh, fighting the british so why would that be a bad bad idea i mean if, because he has to ultimately use as many people as he can to make a big army so if there are people there are jihadi elements why not uh, you know divert that energy towards uh, the british maybe that's what he was thinking when he allowed these people to be in the army would you what do you say to that of course uh, if you have a common enemy 
uh, you can forge an alliance, tactical alliance. So in the historiography of uh, uh, independence movement, especially from the received wisdom that we now have in the official histories after independence, it more or less is portrayed as if uh, there were two centers of um, this conflict. On one side, you have the British, on the other side, the Indians. Within the Indians, there may be um, dissensions on communal basis, but ultimately British uh, on one side and Indians on the other. The reality is significantly different. There were three political centers in the entire history of independence movement. One is the British, one is the Hindu, and one is the Muslims. Hindus and Muslims collaborated when uh, it suited them to their joint fight against the British. Muslims in 1857 even, again, that may become another controversy. 1857 participation of Muslims um, should be reassessed. A lot of uh, jihadi elements, proper jihadi, Wahhabi elements, and their role in 1857 and their influence and significance has to be assessed. There should be, there is actually a lot of data available to say enough about it, about what they were doing in 1857. But if you study properly the history that Pakistan uh, teaches to its uh, students, and um, even um, Muslim League during the days of independence used to say, their leaders used to say in their speeches, for them, Muslims were the rulers of India. Power was taken away from them by Hindus, Marathas. And then came British. Muslims were already fighting their jihad to regain their uh, rule. So you already had a lot of Muslim personalities that I mentioned in another talk I had given uh, on Sangam. You had Muslim personalities before 1857, uh, even in late 1700s onwards, who were waging this uh, War from Muslim perspective, war of independence for Muslims, for establishing Islamic rule, Islamic supremacy. That politics did not disappear. It has still not disappeared, but definitely in the independence movement, uh, throughout independence movement, there was that um, consciousness, that political um, awareness amongst the Muslims. Maybe. Uh, some Muslims were more articulate, some were less articulate, and some Muslims were less affected by this also. But still, the point remains, the independence movement events that when we analyze, we should look at three parties. What were British doing? What were these people doing? And what were Hindus doing? It is absolutely clear. Then around 1920, we see a new thread starting with Mahatma Gandhi's uh, coming to the central focus of Congress and uh, leaders like Chitranjan Das and even after that, their uh, successors in a way, uh, the Bose brothers, you see a new thought process that, hey, actually we are not two political um, centers. We are one, Hindu and Muslim. Let us create a nation. Let us start thinking in terms of uh, um, secular patriotism. Up till then, up till that point of, let's say, 1920, roughly speaking, it didn't happen like that. Indian nationalism came from Bengal. We all know that. It started with great uh, thinkers, I would say. Great thinkers like uh, Nabugopal uh, uh, Mitra, who for the first time in the modern India, articulated what is Indian nationalism. And very clearly, their, their answer was Hindu 
nationalism is indian nationalism see for nationalism you must have some common some uh, shared emotional bonding which goes deep enough for you to relinquish other identities and keep this identity so i can be very proud of being from my village i can be very proud of uh, speaking a language i can be very also proud of having um, been born in a family i can be proud of my state my city etc but ultimately which is the limit of your identity what is your topmost identity that defines what is your nationalism i'm just articulating what uh, these early uh, nationalist leaders of bengal and india thought and quite honestly i did mention that in my uh, talk on uh, ina on sangam it finds connection with what samuel huntington says in his uh, seminal uh, whole body of work about clash of civilizations civilization not a geography defines your ultimate identity muslims were always clear about that for a muslim his ultimate identity is not being a pakistani or bangladeshi or anything like that it's being a muslim let me ask it this way ask this question in a different way for an individual for me let's say if i have to make a choice you give up your indian citizenship or you give up your hindu dharma which one will i give up that question defines what is your nationalism give up your caste give up your language give up your nationality or citizenship or hindu dharma you can keep only one which one will you keep that question defines your civilization which civilization you belong to indian muslims or muslims anywhere in the world are clear about that is all i'm saying and they don't even feign they are honest about it they say i am a muslim first hindus on the other hand get into this confusion so uh, continuing uh, going back to the that thought process up to 1920 indian leaders were hindu leaders were very clear about this uh, this concept so the hindu melas nabagopal mitra uh, used to create these hindu melas and after that another leader uh, raj narayan basu is a friend and collaboration um, in collaboration of which he used to he they created an organization which was pan india it was based in bengal but its vision was not bengal alone they created they used to bring the artists and singers and artworks from um, kashmir from up from rajasthan from south india to bengal and used to have a convention uh, from you know participation from hindus um, all over uh, bengal they would create uh, so many nationalistic uh, press drama they created so much of uh, uh, gymnasium type of activity the thought process was our nationalism is hindu nationalism most um, articulately expressed by arbindo later he says sanatan dharma is indian nationalism there is no other indian nationalism sanatan dharma is indian nationalism the revolutionaries that we saw uh, from anushilan samiti or uh, yugantara etc the cid reports clearly mention that the uh, right of passage for a revolutionary to move into the inner circle used to be that they would draw on the floor with a chalk uh, a human skeleton they would lie down in that skeleton with bhagavad gita in one hand pistol in the other and they would sing vande mataram so bhagavad gita in your hand is your nationalism it continued absolutely no confusion about it in his uh, writings and speeches he very clearly says that hindu nationalism is indian nationalism 
बिपिन चंद्र पाल अगेन स्टडी बिपिन चंद्र पाल वर्क लोकमान्य तिलक इफ लोकमान्य तिलक इज नॉट हिंदुत्व आई डोंट नो हु इज हिंदुत्व सो इन 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 द कन्वर्जेशन कोऑर्डिनेटेड बाय श्री सुरजित somebody said that okay no 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 just tell hindutva leaders which hindutva leader did something or or the other and they were excluding tilak etc all the way up to 1930s congress was also hindutva the lot of hindutva leaders were in congress many times congress president and hindu mahasabha president would be the same person i give more than one example lal rajpat rai was president of hindu mahasabha and president of congress pandit madan mohan malviya was president of congress and president of mahasabha as well congress sessions up to 1937 uh, the annual all india Con- uh, congress uh, committee sessions annual conventions used to coincide uh, with the mahasabha conventions also mahasabha uh, used to happen in the same city on the same date because lot of workers activists leaders of congress were mahasabha people so since we were traveling to a city uh, we will all be there let us meet on the side for mahasabha as well it is in 1920s onwards with mahatma gandhi's new thought um, and uh, taken so enthusiastically by so many of the hindu leaders also that this nationalism which uh, was celebrating uh, ganpati annual festivals and uh, shivaji's um, rajyotsav that was abandoned slowly so many other things were abandoned bande mataram would be abandoned so many other things would be abandoned to dilute that core civilizational identity to accommodate this uh, you know other party that uh, we want to forcefully bring and uh, make an ally so this thought process was going on but uh, i digress to far far away from your question sana ji you were saying uh, did neta ji think that uh, by u- utilizing the energy islamist energy of the muslims uh, he could benefit uh, in the fight against uh, british um, i think so i think he might have thought the that the results were there right the results are there in the sense that uh, uh, ini did give a huge knock to the british government british uh, indian the british uh, indian british army no so there are a couple of things here see uh, i did not mention the japan so much um, the japan's work with the muslims in the previous talk just like nazis japan government and japan strategy in the war was also to collaborate with muslims especially because they had colonies like uh, malaysia i mean that they have one full of muslims some of them quite fanatical also that if you read the speeches given by the generals etc of japan japanese imperial um, army you would feel surprised in one speech one general compared shinto religion with islam said that uh, just like prophet uh, muhammad had um, fought so also our emperor is fighting there was a lot of rhetoric created for uh, for for muslims to be encouraged in supporting the war against the british uh, so that's not unique it was in the atmosphere and i would not be surprised um, if both felt the same way to utilize this zeal of muslims in making them allies Uh, because he had that charisma to actually make them uh, feel that patriotism he had it to not patriotism Th- that's the way i differ sure in his rhetoric he, he, he see don't get me wrong he is patriotic and he is appealing also for patriotism but devil is in the detail he, in the speeches of both even in germany he would often say that you will do a service to islam if you fight with me against british you would mention it and here in singapore again if you read not netaji's speeches i'm saying but if you read the documents of ina officers which i mentioned some of them i mentioned in in the talk that muslims would feel far more uh, enthusiastic about islamic causes 
Okay. So Ab- Abdul Rashid, for example, there are many. Abdul Rashid, for example, um, all the um, Muslim soldiers of INA, ex-INA, who uh, participated in the Muslim League, uh, all of that, all the um, larger body of uh, thought currents would totally align with they actually being feeling it and saying it. So the other thing is that if we look back in history, when we look at the Hindu rulers, so many of them had Muslims in their armies. So whether it is Pitvira Chauhan or the Maratha rulers, so they had uh, Muslims in their uh, army. So, uh, so I'm just wondering what, what could Netaji have done differently? Because uh, do you think that in the 1940s, uh, Netaji could have raised a Hindu army to uh, fight the British? Remember, even Savarkar, he talked so much about militarizing the Hindus, but he could not do what uh, Netaji did. He could not put an army together. <laughs> no, no, no. So we should, again, be careful uh, in collecting the dots here. There is uh, some evidence of Netaji actually appreciating Savarkar, re- giving a call of militarize the Hindus. There is a quotation of uh, Netaji, which is not confirmed whether he actually said it and if he did, when and where, it is not clear. In that quotation, Netaji appreciates Savarkar for exhorting Indians to join the British army. Uh, He said, because these Indian soldiers then give us the uh, human resource for our own INA. Now, that quotation may be correct or not correct. I don't know about that. But uh, Shri Vikram Sampat in his own book uh, has brought out additional evidences to suggest that Netaji, again, he doesn't say Netaji. That's my uh, thing. Netaji must have felt very happy to have more Hindus than Muslims uh, coming in. The reason being, not only all the uh, treacheries that happened, um, particularly those which were, uh, once Turkey joined the World War II, there were a lot of uh, desertions by the Muslim INA officers. So again, I think one of the reactions... This is documented. documented. Of course, it is documented. I gave, even in my talk, I mentioned. So what happened is, Turkey was neutral in the Second World War up to beginning of 1945. Towards the end of the World War II, they joined on the side of the British. Turkey, which was neutral because of a treaty they had, uh, they joined British. And when they joined the British side, many Muslim officers of INA deserted INA. You said, is it documented? It is. There is one most important document, which is diary of Colonel P.K. Sehgal. P.K. Sehgal, same uh, Colonel P.K. Sehgal who was tried in the Red Fort, he wrote in his diary uh, the reasons why these desertions happened. He was the investigating officer sent by Netaji to investigate these desertions. And the first point he mentions in his diary is that once Turkey has joined on the British side, many of the Muslim officers see that by fighting against British, British, they are going to be doing um, a fight against Islam. So therefore, they cannot fight anymore. P.K. Segal again, further in the same point, he says, we try to explain a lot the circumstances under which Turkey has been forced to join the British side, uh, but it had no effect on Muslim officers and there is a widespread feeling amongst them that they will be doing um, um, a fight against Islam if they fought against Turkey. It's mentioned. So, um, didn't answer going back to... Of, hmm. What could Netaji have done differently? I mean. So, uh, yes. So, uh, Netaji, therefore, had reasons to... I Again, my conjecture. To be grateful to Savarkar. Because Savarkar was exhorting Hindus to join more and more. Netaji, uh, I'm not saying, should have kept Muslims out, etc. Indeed, in the first uh, European version, majority of the soldiers that actually joined uh, Ajad Hind Fauj were Hindus only, despite so much of effort Netaji put in appealing to Muslims. Majority of soldiers were Hindus. Only less than 15% was Muslim. 
Netaji need not have kept Muslims out or anything like that. I don't think um, any uh, practical wisdom would come out of uh, doing anything like that. I do. I think he was completely. I mean, he he was he was working with the resources he had uh, available to him. He could not have kept Muslims. So though, out. though you are critiquing this part about uh, too many Islamists in INA, there there was there's actually no other. There's no real alternative. Again, uh, I think uh, I'm not. It's a simplistic reduction of saying that uh, <laughs> I'm saying keep Muslims out. Not saying that. Don't compromise with your nationalism. Don't compromise with your understanding of what Indian nationalism really is. Don't compromise on, for example, giving up your language, your anthem, your symbols, your icons, your war cry. Don't dilute your own nationalism to accommodate additional. Uh, party into it like savarkar said you fight your war if they join you welcome them if they don't join you fight alone uh, you made your point clear here but uh, i actually want to uh, critique you for what you said about the language issue the, it's the last mm. part of this uh, the last part of this talk i guess uh, you made quite a big deal of including uh, hindustani in the uh, ina so i was a bit puzzled because we had homegrown uh, hindu poets like bismil who sang uh, sarparoshi ki tamanna ab hamare dil mein hai then uh, we also like premchand also premchand used a lot of urdu in his writing um, and then uh, when you mentioned the translation of janagana mana when i looked at it it's shubh sukh chain ki barkha barse bharat bhag hai jaga it has lot of sanskrit words in it uh, you can accuse it of being mediocre poetry not uh, the same standard as janagana mana but it doesn't sound like there was an attempt to divorce uh, sanskrit from it so i was a bit puzzled uh, by what you said sab sukh chain thing is not so much uh, my problem with that is not uh, that it's uh, urdu or bad poetry etc uh, it's different it's um, it so to understand that let us understand the role that uh, or the position of vande matram and janagana mana in the indian independence movement all through as i mentioned earlier the revolutionary activity used jan vande mataram as the de facto national anthem it was mantra of indian independence even congress sessions would commence and end with vande mataram after uh, 1911 1912 i think starting with 1911 janaganamana also Uh, was another song so vande matram and janaganamana continued both of them continued to be widely accepted very cherished inspiring songs anthems which were um, only in 1930s uh, you had the muslim league saying that vande matram Uh, should not be sung there are a lot of uh, news reports of the time speeches of the time where uh, muslims not only muslim league but uh, even outside muslim league made a big issue out of vande matram saying that it is worshiping devi and we cannot worship devi so then congress leadership said all right so janagana mana is going to be our anthem and we shall continue with janagana mana so congress uh, still uh, at least not the entire song of vande matram but just the words vande matram used to still uh, be used uh, along with bharat mata ki jai etc in the speeches by the leaders swarth chandra bose himself in many of his speeches when he was in congress he would end his speech with vande matram so my point about this uh, sab sukh chain is willingness of sacrificing giving up your nationally cherished symbols of nationalism like janagana mana janagana mana and for what 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 is the reason for giving it up so he said janagana mana has too much sanskrit in it it is sanskritized hindi or uh, bengali so it should be it's not suitable for uh, being the national anthem national anthem should be in a uh, non or desanskritized hindi he said Who now said that? it Netaji said that. Netaji. So what happened is, 
it is recorded in uh, one of the books that uh, when it was clear that netaji uh, is coming to singapore and uh, he would come and take up the leadership until that point bande matram was the de facto national anthem of ina also so ina in um, the in, in east asia all the rallies all the parades would uh, end with bande matram the uh, the uh, civil population not the army itself but indian independence league population i'm talking about they would all uh, use bande matram all the movies by the way there are some interesting things uh, just like uh, later in independent india when a movie in a theater will uh, start you will have janaganamana now they don't do that anymore but you would sing janaganamana then movie will start uh, there uh, bande matram had that stature bande matram was always used in 1930s once congress uh, responded to the muslim objections to vande matram they said okay do janaganamana here also in east asia they adopted janaganamana as the song it used to be sung once netaji arrived netaji gave up both the symbol of charkha and the song of janaganamana as the national symbol and the anthem charkha was replaced by springing tiger and janaganamana was replaced by a translation of it again i'm not saying it is lot of urdu etc but yes it desasmitizes uh, janaganamana sab sukh chain written by um, abid ali uh, hasan but it has a lot of sanskrit in it it may have a lot of sanskrit in it why do you what is why why do we uh, get rid of janaganamana my thing is janaganamana is a mantra hmm. just like vande matram was a mantra you give it up and again look at it in the larger perspective charkha was given up so the flag of uh, indian national army up to this point had it's it was the congress flag it had tricolor with charkha on it netaji said charkha will be also replaced and he chose a springing tiger that might be because charkha might have seemed like a pacifist symbol to him and tiger gives that you know that aggressiveness that we are going to fight this war so that can be explained yes um, it, it can explain that uh, that's one explanation uh, another explanation is and it's not explanation by me many people have written it in the books uh, he picked it up from tipu sultan of mysore tip sultan uh, tiger uh, of mysore so uh, that is the inspiration for that tiger i do not know the reality uh, your explanation may be I the valid one i think you started another controversy now <laughs> i am not saying it i have not said it it is written in multiple books okay i have not said it tip sultan he was um, referred to um, by not only netaji many leaders as a nationalistic patriotic muslim freedom fighter right so netaji also i mean again i'm saying don't 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 no, uh, no because he fought the british <laughs> who was seen as a person that's it so somebody who fought with the british becomes a freedom fighter t2 meer and their bengal personality right. he fought british t2 meer was proper wahabi and t2 meer uh, fought british he fought um, um, so he becomes a freedom fighter these days in narrative t2 meer is also a freedom fighter and of course so, Netaji also that's why uh, met uh, met Hitler right because Hitler was fighting uh, the British he was fighting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. fighting our enemies so in that I have no problem with that so I have absolutely zero problem with that mm-hmm. uh, even Congress do you know in 1937 All India Congress Committee head of reception committee was Saint Gobind Das in his welcome address of all the leaders. in his welcome address he said congress party is comparable to the nazi party of germany and fasci party of italy for us indians gandhi ji is what hitler is to the germans and mussolini is to um, italians and what stalin is to the russians or communists it is the head of congress reception committee of the all india congress committee in tripuri or perhaps it was not tripuri year before so <laughs> yeah. even congress 
but uh, so i have no fault uh, i have no problem with with that aspect others might have i am not one to say see every personality and here i am not evaluating or judging bose at all my scope was ina bose can be a separate topic in itself we can talk about bose also every personality political personality of independence movement has three or four dimensions on which we should study them one dimension of course is what is the end game objective and policies for them to fight the british for example gandhi's was uh, i don't know whether it was purna swaraj all, all the way till end of 30s perhaps until quit india movement he was talking about dominion status etc so what is the what is the vision of your uh, what you are fighting for against the british that is first dimension neta ji was for purna swaraj he was completely for purna swaraj since uh, his earlier days second dimension that you should analyze every uh, leader is what is the methods and means through which they want to achieve that gandhi was all about pacifism satyagraha non violence non cooperation and subhas bos uh, again it's very clear uh, that uh, he was not opposed to using violent means also to fight for the independence just like all the revolutionaries just like even bankim um, uh, thought process just like uh, arbind ghosh just like all the other revolutionaries was also felt that third dimension you should analyze then very importantly unfortunately we become sensitive about it third dimension is what was their policy towards the hindu muslim question what did they think what was their diagnosis of the problem and what was their solution that is where really uh i think problems are we don't analyze that dimension at all and then comes the fourth one which is the least important one would be the personal character skills integrity charisma magnetism of that individual personality so bose as i said uh, you know it's not about bose whatever i was saying was not about bose it was about jihadis of ina bose uh, of course consistently not just in the ina phase right from the days when he was mayor of calcutta continuously he was following uh, a diagnosis of the hindu muslim issue he felt that it was an artificial divide he said it's an artificial divide created by the british that hindus and muslims uh, are really not all that different british have created it nehru for example his diagnosis was it's an economic question nehru's speeches uh, about this diagnosis of hindu muslim issue is muslims are poor hindus are wealthy um, make uh, muslims little more wealthy and uh, bring equality then this will not happen they saw riots um, many times th- th- this thought process sees riots as economic riots not hindu muslim riots they say don't see the rioter um, um, in terms of communal identity but poor versus rich there are a lot of uh, Uh, post independence literature that does that as well sardar patel you can analyze on these three four dimensions as two what is that sardar was fighting for what is that he felt could be the means what he felt about hindu muslim question what were his personal qualities personal thought processes and in the first one you should also include what did they think about independence india's economic political picture as well there would be different ideas you would receive but uh, i got carried away and i uh, sana ji i don't know if i addressed what you were saying no no yes you you made a very good point and uh, i think we we should we have already talked for about uh, more than almost 2 hours so i think it's a good time to close it we have had a very productive uh, discussion very very interesting and we learned about a very momentous period in our history when on one hand we are trying to get rid of uh, foreign occupiers and on the other hand we are having these uh, internal uh, communal wars so at this time you know we this this is a very complex period and uh, but today of course we have the luxury of hindsight so we can say that the leader should have done this or should not have done this 
but uh, we can't forget the context in which they took all those uh, decisions absolutely absolutely and uh, i think we should also um, it's very important that uh, we should not put our heroes on such a uh, tall pedestal that we cannot question them that we cannot ask questions about their decisions or you know discuss uh, anything about them so i i am i'm very happy that we are talking about all these things let there be debates let there be discussions but it needs to be conducted in a civil manner you know where there's no ad hominem and personal attacks that we have been seeing a lot of these days so i think uh, you started off with talking about vada i think that's the that's what we should try to usher in where we are all trying to find the truth you know to pull together our our uh, knowledge our facts and then try to uh, find out what was the truth but of course we will never know the full truth about certain things like what we are discussing here uh, events that happened during our freedom struggle we won't know the complete truth uh, so but what we should do is that we should try to distill all our arguments and kind of create a knowledge bank which is going to be useful even in the future so that's these are some of my thoughts do you want to add anything more or uh, no i i think you said it sana ji uh, i just want to thank you for <laughs> having this conversation thank you so thank much you. thank you so much namaste because it was very very interesting